So, cities. Um, cities have long been places uh, of attraction. It's uh, over millennia. Uh, it's where we come together to exchange money and goods. Uh, it's where we come to exchange ideas and fertilize each other intellectually. And it's where people also exchange genes and mate. Uh, exciting places, uh, and they're at the core of our civilization today. Cities have been so successful that they've grown to uh, immense sizes. Most of us know what it's about. Uh, more than half the planet today lives uh, in cities, and by 2030, it's predicted that as many people who live on the planet today will live in cities alone. Okay, so it's a major movement, it's only increasing, and it's also introducing some challenges. We all know about congestion, that's contributing to environmental pollution along with industrialization. There are issues of poverty, issues of crime, issues of uh, emergency relief. So cities are places that are, at the same time, very attractive, very productive, great places to be in, but they pre present many challenges. Now, what's happening recently that's exciting is that there's a technological shift. We're seeing a digital network or a digital uh, environment merging itself with a physical environment. Think sensors, little computational devices. Almost everything around us becomes both physical and digital. And that's, that's profound. Now, think ubiquitous connectivity together with this. It means that objects can start to talk to other objects that can talk to people who can talk back to those objects and make these objects do things. And things can start to synchronize. And as a result, we're able to start to address some of those major problems that are impacting cities in completely new ways. And that's fundamental. So um, a lot of people are working on this uh, around the world on seeing how you can utilize this new condition. Uh, that's in the key of the work uh, carried out by the Sensible City Lab at MIT. Um, and I'm going to give a few examples of what this means. And I want to focus on two main elements, just to illustrate a point that will then uh, guide us during our panel afterward. So when you have something that you can observe very precisely, sense it, right? Uh, it gives you a lot of power to actually conduct analysis and learn about whatever it is you're looking at. Okay, so today with the digitization of cities, we can sense uh, in a powerful way flows and things in real time. You can analyze that data, but it becomes really powerful when you can actuate and close the feedback loop, making things respond. So let's look at a few ideas. Sensing in this project at the Sensible City Lab, uh, we took sort of readily available data. This was uh, taxi data that the New York City um, a City Hall makes available to anybody. Um, all the pickups and drop-offs uh, uh, for a whole year in the city, over 150 million trips. And uh, you know, this is just an illustration of what the data is. Um, the, uh, the yellow is pickup, the blue is drop-off. And we started analyzing this data. The goal of this research was to ask, can you give the same level of service in terms of mobility to people in the city, but using less cars? And so we started to work uh, on a basic analysis, and we realized, first of all, that there is great symmetry. Right? So people take rides from one place to, uh, uh, to another, and a similar number of people take ride back. Right? So it means that you can start to balance that system. So it suggested that there may be a mathematical solution to, uh, sharing, uh, to sharing trips and optimizing uh, how people use a transportation network. Actually, this was uh, then developed into a publication that was uh, uh, um, published in PLOS One, uh, where we showed a new mathematical solution through a shareability network uh, that allowed us to reduce the number of cars by 40% and still keep the level of service in the city the same. So what we introduced is a little delta of two minutes. So you wait an extra two minutes, you go with another person in the car, and you get dropped off at maximum 50 meters farther away from where you would have been dropped off. And all of a sudden, 40% less cars. So think about the potential of this. There's now companies around the world, uh, ride-sharing companies, that are uh, using similar principles uh, uh, to uh, uh, offer pooling services. Uh, so that's a, it's a, this will have a big impact on transportation networks in the city. And that's only due to using readily available data and mathematical analysis. So very powerful. Now, how can we actuate? 
And this is a project that initially started uh, in partnership with the mayor of Copenhagen uh, and the Sensible City Lab, where we asked how can we, conf how can we find a compelling alternative to the automobile. So uh, we started looking at bikes because they were very attractive. They were smaller scale, uh, they're lean, they're cheap, they're everywhere, people love them. Uh, bicycle sharing uh, uh, systems are appearing all around the world. Uh, and bicycles at the same time have a big problem. A and it lies again in urban form. So cities as we know them have grown tremendously since we introduced the automobile. Uh, automobile. Look, at, look at London in the 1500s, right? And look at how it grew and then this is the transition between uh, the 1860s, 1880s, uh, to the 1930s, with the introduction of motorized transport. It's immense growth. We grew it because we could. We could suddenly live farther from where we work, where we spend time with our friends and family. So bicycles are not relevant for these kind of distances. Most of us cannot traverse these large distances using our own body. So there's a fundamental mismatch. Actually, we studied this and we realized that beyond 15 kilometers, there's a big drop off in cycling and that hills are also uh, uh, standing in the way uh, of people jumping on a bike. So what we decided to do is leave the bike as is. There's a lot of companies making great bikes around the world, but introduce a little robot, something that can imitate your body and make you like a Superman, make you think that you're doing the work, but allow you to traverse those big distances um, in the city. This was uh, initially done uh, as a, an academic project where MIT um, patented this and later it was spun off into a company called Super Pedestrian that's now uh, bringing it to market and shipping this as a product. Uh, it's a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, here's what's inside it. It's, uh, it's got a motor, a movable battery, uh, a whole bunch of, computer, uh, of computers, wireless connectivity that connects to your phone, and all of this uh, is put inside the rear wheel. When you pedal, uh, this thing learns the most minute things you do with your legs, like really delicate stuff. And then it imitates you precisely. And over time, it learns more and more uh, how you like to use your body when you ride a bike. And when it, when it uh, comes into action, it multiplies your power by three times, by uh, eight times, up to 40 times, uh, depending on the terrain you're on. Now, you can control this thing with your phone, so uh, you can lock and unlock it. You can share information with other cyclists that are relevant uh, for the cycling community. You can collect information from your environment. And if you're a geek, you can write cycling apps on our API. You can really think of this. When, when we set out to design this, uh, we said, let's put this on the cyclist. If we could, we would. It's not very effective, so we decided to put this thing uh, on the bike itself. But the essence of it is that the rider thinks that he or she is doing the work, and it just amplifies your power. It's almost the true sense of a machine in, a, in, in that uh, it extends the capabilities of our body. There's another way to think about it, uh, which is like a legal performance enhancer. <laughs> um, this is an example uh, for uh, what happens when you use this. So you ride it just like a normal bike. Uh, you can see the data below of the torque you generate and the torque generated by the uh, the machine itself, very seamless. And then when you backpedal, it regenerates, captures your energy, and recharges back the batteries. So if you think about all the space that you could reclaim using fewer cars, using more human-scale transportation, what could a future city look like? Maybe it's something more like this. Right Now, I want to move away uh, a little bit from uh, transportation to give another example using a fun project that's now going on at the Sensible City Lab that's about public health. So here we're looking at what's going on in our guts. So many of you may know that uh, the microbiome is being mapped these days. It's another big undertaking following the mapping of the human genome. Now, the microbiome can tell us a lot about the state of our health. Some say that there are more bacteria in our body than there are cells in our body. Um, so what we did is we, we decided to ask, can we use the sewer system as a proxy for the collective health of a neighborhood? So we started thinking about sewer, and we realized that sewer is a location-based, right? By definition, it collects uh, it collects uh, the refuge from neighboring houses, and it's time-based, because there is flow through it. 
So we developed little, let's call them robotic samplers, that just dive into the sewer from the manhole, collect samples, and then we perform PCR to amplify the genes of the bacteria we're, looking at, uh, we're going after, which are giving us indicators uh, of uh, public health levels. So this is an example of some uh, courageous yet miserable MIT grad students jumping into the sewer uh, when we're starting to do this analysis. Um, and uh, this is an example of, of some of the data that we collected. This is in partnership with Eric Alm's lab at, at MIT. So this is just one sample from that particular experiment. We look at how much data there is in there. And what we're doing now is we're building propagation models, because if you have one uh, one manhole, and then you have other sewers next to it, you can start to look at how things propagate and how disease becomes contagious between one place and another, uh, how income impacts public health, how access to transportation impacts public health, and so on and so forth. So it's quite a powerful tool. So I'm going to end here. This was just to set the stage for our discussion of how technology might impact cities as they evolve. Uh, thanks, everybody. This was a very good introduction about the future of the cities. Um, cities of the future. May I introduce you to Andrian Kreie, senior editor of Süddeutsche Zeitung, who will introduce the panel and will lead the discussion. Thank you, Adrian, Andrian, for coming. Wonderful. Thanks, Jeffy. So, and um, thanks, Asad. Um, <laughs> These talks make me always feel like the Jetsons are moving in next, week, next month into the neighborhood. Um, I think this is a reference for older people. <laughs> might be, you might be too young of a crowd. Anyway, <clears throat> the Jetsons still are kind of the blueprint um, of what the life in the city of the future could be. And we have three people here um, who you should talk to, and I will talk to, if you kind of want to know what the future of life in the city is. I'll just start here with Asaf Biedermann from MIT Sensible City Labs, which um, is hard to describe in like a short introduction, but anyway, this is where the future of life in the city is kind of um, fermenting, breeding. <laughs> then we have Claudia Nemat uh, from the board of uh, Telecom, and um, she's very much involved in building infrastructures that are, have nothing to do with roads and sewers and bicycles. Um, she'll tell about us about that. And we have Nico Moore uh, from um, um, McKinsey, uh, <laughs> McKinsey. And they've just done a study that is really interesting because it gives you some new demographics and numbers about the future of life in the cities. And they're currently working on how these numbers will actually uh, be implemented or how they actually will um, matter in the uh, city of the future. So um, I'll ask you, because you kind of know the hands-on on the ground, how far ahead into the future of the smart city are we actually? <laughs> See, actually today we have the situation that most cities have rather traditional infrastructures with different applications. Yes, we have smart traffic lights that steer the traffic. We have street lights that are smart, which react to uh, weather conditions and can also signal certain things uh, to uh, police or security departments. But as a matter of fact, we have very different applications with data islands, if you may say so. And as you were indicating, in the future, this will move more towards connecting these applications and to pro produce something which I would call data oceans. And that enables the connection of data from one application with another one. To make it practical and use your example, you said with mathematical algorithm and data collection, you can actually monitor the movements um, of traffic or of people. Yeah? If you connect that to public transportation, you could make sure whenever there is a spontaneous assembly of human beings, because there is a sale in a shop or spontaneous assembly of musicians 
or Opera is ending, you have automated, automated uh, traffic transportations or taxis or whatever vehicle, smart vehicle, coming to this point. And that will be the future, but frankly, we are not yet there now. I just want to say, I mean, if you live in Munich, which is a supposedly very smart city, according to Tyler Brule and all these listings, but when you wait for the suburban train in Russia, or you feel like you live in a very dumb city, See. so currently the biggest infrastructure problem here is like how to put two tracks for the suburban train under the city, which is like still very 19th century. Um, maybe you can give us an insight because you're working on this study. How, like, what are the challenges for cities to become smart? I think it's a lot about what do we understand on, with, with the term smart city. So when we, when we talk about smart cities, we see basically four elements describing a smartness of a city. And I think, Asaf, you, you described it very well with your examples. Um, one, one element is an existing infrastructure, so which means we need something like smart pipes, we need something like smart mobility in place, we need something like connected buildings in place, these kind of infrastructure which is necessary to, to bring out use cases and applications which then can serve uh, people with, with whatever is necessary. The second element is um, everything about uh, digital backbone. Yeah, we definitely need connectivity, we need, we need, um, we need uh, uh, um, uh, 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 connectivity in place to have the transmission standards. We, we need to have these uh, connected uh, devices in place so that, that this over, overall works. Then the, the third element is uh, everything about intelligence. So we need analytics in place, so as you described, uh, so to bring all these data together. You said data ocean. Yeah, but in, in the end, we need to have intelligence in place to get information out of this data ocean. Yeah? And the fourth element then is we need to have uh, intelligent services um, which then can be offered to the people in the city. So, and then going back to that, uh, that question before, how far are we? I, I, I absolutely agree. We are just at the beginning, I would say. I mean, but you're at MIT, you're basically not only encouraged, you're almost forced to dream. So you come up with these projects and you come up with these, uh, especially at Sensible, Sensible City Lab, you come up with these, um, these concepts. Do you deal with the lack of something like a digital, uh, like an ocean of data? Um, or do you build this into these projects, into the concepts already? I, I don't think um, anywhere today there's lack of data. If you just look at the, at, at the, at, at the telecom networks uh -huh. yeah. out there, and they cover socio-demographic divides, right? They're all over the world almost. Uh -huh. uh, these are amazing sort of sensors for what people do in many ways. Uh -huh. So I don't think there's lack of data. And I would argue that there's maybe a missing point. Uh, data is, is powerful because it allows us to see. Analysis allows us to learn. Um, but how do you make things happen? Uh, there's a big difference between the internet, which is a virtual place, right, and the physical environment we live in. The city is, has got a lot of inertia. It's, it's got mass. It's, got con it's built from concrete and steel and things. Uh, and it changes very slowly, like you said, right? right. It makes sense that it changes slowly, because uh, these things are very heavy and very expensive. Now, if we want to start to impact the city faster, right, we need to come up with new ways of making things happen. So one thing that's probably going to happen is robotics is going to play a much greater role in our lives uh, than we know it today. And I don't mean robotics R2D2 style. I mean robotics as in <laughs> small things that can really dance with our body or move around us and synchronize in a, seam in a seamless way, in an elegant way. Right. Um, and you know, self-driving cars are one example for robots, but there are many others. So one thing is to close that feedback loop. We need to be able to make things move and respond, right? And the other thing is that people need to be able to get access Absolutely. to that data, because people are the ultimate actuators of the place, of the place they live in. So how, how do you make it accessible? Uh, design is in the heart of it. 
actually democratization of the data is in the heart of it, right? How is it not just services designed from the top down? How do you let anybody design those services? These are really a, a crucial elements to benefit from right. this big potential. Do we already have that ocean of data no, that we can use? Maybe a practical remark. It's indeed true. It's not a lack of data, but a lack of meaningful connection, interpretation, right. and access. This is what I meant. It's then islands, yeah? Because you have to catch the fish in this big ocean of water. But very practically speaking, if you look at today's cities in Europe, and if you look at the projects which started working in cities, you see that everything which has a clear business case from a city's mayor's perspective has a chance. And what we practically see happening is the following. Parking is a big issue in most cities. 30% of the traffic is generated by cars and buses moving around, not finding that. Yeah? These street lights, they account for more than 30% of the city's electricity costs. So even though this is not you know, big futuristic, but as a matter of fact, because it's such a pain point, yeah? because all the mayors need money, yes? and uh, they hate um, tourist buses traveling around, there's a stronger likelihood to do concrete projects which are happening across Europe around these things first. Yeah? So this is as a practical remark how this is going to happen. Yeah, maybe, maybe to add one point to that, I think there's a big difference between the developed countries and the developing yes. countries. Yeah? In, in the developed countries, everything is driven by business cases. Yeah? So the decision is driven by business cases. In the developing countries, many decisions are driven by the challenge these big cities are confronted with. So that, that brings these cities into the position to maybe leapfrog and, and move to an, to an infrastructure or to an intelligence which is latest thinking and which is not driven by a business case decision in the developed countries, I like in the developed totally countries. I totally agree. I must say the most disruptive innovation we have done recently in Deutsche Telekom, we did not necessarily always start in Germany, but sometimes more at the outer skirt, yeah? In so, no, <laughs> like Albania or um, Bucharest, even though I wouldn't call it a developing country, yeah? Be because sometimes you can leapfrog things because there's just an issue you need to solve, yeah? And then this is actually driving the implementation of certain technology. But, but here's, here's a question. Um, is, so you mentioned business cases that come from, you know, what cities care about uh, and might promote, like parking issues, like, synchrony of lights and uh, energy reallocation, which all make a lot of sense. At the same time, your cities are broke today, right? And, uh, and there's a lot of entrepreneurs looking to do stuff, right? And, and if you think about it, Waze, the navigation app, never asked for uh, permission from any mayor. Yep. Neither did a famous uh, ride-hailing company. Right, yes. uh, but there's still a very strong business case. So it's probably going to come also from, from the people. Both angles, from yeah. both angles. Yeah. And th then to your mm -hmm. point, because the uh, design, the ease of use, yeah. yeah, like your bike. That's a perfect example. You have traditional technology, and you add smartness, and voila, mobility goes better. Also for people who are not trained to be a super athletes. I fully agree, yeah, that type of innovation will come bottom up from entrepreneurs providing things which are convenient to the consumer. I think it's both, not either or. Yeah. Mm. I want to go quickly back to the leapfrogging phenomenon. Um, because, I mean, you, you have the leapfrogging in the megacities who do it out of a necess necessity. And then don't you also have, I mean, you, you've been involved in, in projects all over the world, also in, in Asia, Arab world in Africa, isn't there also kind of this leapfrogging in smart cities that are just built from the ground up in kind of the, in, you know, in China there's hundreds of cities built from the ground up. So we as European cities, where do we stand here and how can we compete with the speed the cities are developing right now? See, of course, it's true, and that's what your study is confirming, that cities in Asia are really growing like hell. And if you rebuild a city from scratch, yeah. then, of course, you build the streets broader. You, when you dig once, you build in fiber infrastructure. Yeah? So you um, think the digitalization through f while constructing the city. And when you have Kopfsteinpflaster, old narrow streets, and you have the wonderful cities, it's actually more cumbersome and dramatically more expensive. 
uh, to get certain things done. But I don't want to give such a potentially negative outlook here on, on the European cities. I think, and this is also what your study suggested, the fastest growing consumer segments here in Europe are the retiring people mm, yeah, above 60. So I would expect a lot of innovation to happen around smart home, assist living, and assist mobility. And I really believe, because we have the challenge here, that this can be a source of innovation coming from that continent. But isn't that innovation that is very different from, you know, the forward-moving, business-driven, yes. um, futuristic smart city concepts? I mean, don't you have to build for frailty, build for lack of mobility, build for disease? Yeah, I think it's, uh, if, if I could maybe quickly yes. respond on that one, I think it's, it's, it highly depends on what, what, envir what environment you are looking at. Yeah? So for example, as Claudia mentioned, if you look into a city in, in, in Germany, for example, we have an existing infrastructure in place, so we, we are basically talking about evolutionary development of this infrastructure here. Yeah? So we are not discussing leapfrogging in, in that sense. Um, so here we need to look into consumer segments which uh, basically show us consumption growth uh, in that particular segment. So, and the first services basically which will be developed in kind of smartness understanding will probably focus on these segments. This is completely different in developing countries or in, in, in the countries like China or India which have the challenge to deal with these incredible mega city developments. Yeah, these cities are, many of these cities are basically artificially designed. So, and here you can of course start to leapfrog and build in infrastructure which is May maybe the infrastructure of the next century. So, but if these cities are leapfrogging in, in, in other areas and we have to basically think about constructing digital nurses, um, <clears throat> do we technologically and business-wise have, have a chance in Europe to like catch up with? So, absolutely. Hmm. On one thing, you were mentioning, Nico, a number of things that are needed without getting too technical. But one thing is the next generation of networks connectivity, because in order to get that done securely, we will need different types of networks. Those who can really cope with very fast reaction times. Mm -hmm. If you do autonomous driving, you would rather want your car to have a reaction like an athlete, and not like 60 seconds. That's one thing. The other thing is networks that can securely deal with already existent massive amount of data, but the data amount will still explode in the years to come, even though they are massive, and super broadband. And here, Europe still has actually a, a chance, like years ago, when we formed the former 3G standard to make sure that we get that type of connectivity. That is one thing. And the other thing, we had here Jokesa on stage, but I think Europe, and especially Germany, has still, and that is not so much the consumer view, a fantastic industrial sector. Yeah, so this is the entire discussion about Industry 4.0, which is not our discussion today, where I think you combine old engineering capabilities with software, yeah? and the battle is entirely open who's going to win that. So I don't see us being like aged and boring and technology innovation happen elsewhere. And by the way, I have to say, the 60-year-olds of today are like the 35-year-olds 50 years ago. Probably. Uh, there's another thing there, right? So first of all, the, the, first of all the, if you cater for an aging population, it's not bad business. It's great yes. business and, there's, <laughs> and, and, and everybody needs healthcare. So I don't think that's an issue at all. But m let's think about the things that will get disrupted soon, right? Logistics, mm. right? Think about it. A lot of people live in the outskirts of the city center, work in the city center. They come and they take goods out of the city center that are brought by trucks from the outside to take them back to where they came from, right? That's the sort of simplification of logistics, but that's happening everywhere. Uh, that's going to be disrupted. Yeah. Think about it, when things become atomized to the level of the package and start to move uh, by themselves, you'll see a lot of efficiencies. Think healthcare, right? Think education, right? How do you distribute Cambridge, England, right, so to speak, to a much larger number of people? You can today. 
because of access to experiments remotely, because of ability to redistribute uh, um, uh, lectures, because of ability to co-locate uh, uh, in a networked way between different places and share information across networks. So these are just a few things that it doesn't matter if you're a developed country, a developing economy. They're all just, you know, they're, they're, they're major. Question for all three of you. You're talking, <clears throat> you're talking about a, a development that happens right now very fast. It's different paces. Europe has a different pace than Dubai, has a different pace than China. Um, I always wonder if you have this rapid development of cities technologically and inf in, in infrastructures. There's some infrastructures there, you know, the, 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 the grid of Manhattan has been there for a few hundred years. It still works perfectly fine. And it's going to be there probably for another few hundred years. But the other smart thing that I already have in my pocket is my phone. And I have the feeling every two minutes it comes up with another update. And, uh, and it's like this nagging little thing that like updates, updates. Up. How do you build a smart city that doesn't outdate and that or do you, have, do you need update mechanisms built in there? Or how do you, how do you think about this in the long term? How do you make the city smart long term? Want to take this? Or? So, so <laughs> maybe I start. I mean, software as such has anyhow the update mechanisms in it. Yeah? But whenever it comes to real construction, we have longer lifetime cycles. But to, not to repeat what you said, I think even in today's constructed cities, all that Radical disruption on logistics, mobility, healthcare will be possible. By the way, in a few years, your kids will look at the smartphone in a museum and they will probably look as astonished as your smartphones as my kids do when I show the old dial telephone. Yeah? Because they think that the smartphone uh, functionalities are embedded in textile. Yeah? Mm. Chuck light on music on um, and uh, by speech recognition. So this will develop anyhow. I would say, regardless of like how the cities are constructed in cement. Right. I think, you know, it's it's a very valid question: how to keep pace with the technology development as a built-in part of a smart city. So m many many thing is driven by by software updates and these kind of things. I think that that is probably the easier part, but. You know, we, we are talking here about, and, and you mentioned it in your introduction, we are talking here about the combination of physical products and, uh, and uh, 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 data-driven uh, uh, services. So the, the data and software-driven part, I think that's, that can be updated, but you need to keep, keep pace with the development of the physical product. So take a sensor, for example. Yeah? The sensor today, or an actor today, will look completely different in 10 years. So if you talk about a smart pipe, for example, to deliver uh, clean water to people in, in the city, uh, this smart pipe look, will, com will probably, com from a physical perspective, look completely different in 10 years uh, as built-in sensor and actor infrastructure uh, than it looks like today. So correct me if I'm wrong, but what I gauge from this talk is we have three different approaches to the smart city. So we have, in Europe, we have the improvement of old infrastructure into a smart infrastructure. In cities, in mega cities, in, in, in developing countries, we have basically the leapfrogging of, um, let's find a politically correct word, but like the leapfrogging of very weak infrastructure with rapid growth into a smart growth. And then you have like the, in, in, in kind of cities like China or, 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 or the, uh, the Gulf states, you have these cities that are built up from scratch. So you have to basically the approach of creating something completely new. Isn't Europe even at an, at an advantage because we built on something that's already there and that so the outdating mode is not going to be so strong? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think we know the answer to this. But the interesting thing, I think, about Europe uh, is that there is, uh, for, let's take, for example, this part of Europe. Uh, there are some of the best uh, mechatronics engineers on the planet. Right? There's 1.1 million people here who work in the auto industry. The auto industry is going to dramatically change. Right? The volume is going to change. You're not going to drive it. It's going to commoditize in some way. But these companies are probably going to become, again, more like robotics companies that do so many other things. 
because they are the best at doing mechatronics. So Europe has an advantage in that sense that, that is tremendous, has the advantage of the digital infrastructure, and also has the advantage uh, uh, that there is a wheel here, and that's very special to Europe, uh, for governments uh, uh, to actually act as mediator between public good and pushing the envelope on, uh, mm -hmm. on innovation. And that's becoming more and more important as each and every one of us could start to write a program that makes this thing, you know, this m wall move, right? If we can all do that without any sort of agreement about what's in the, in the interest of the public, yeah. we're, gonna we're gonna have quite a bit of chaos. So it, the, Europe is very well positioned for that. So why did you pick, for example, in really pr in practical terms, why did you pick Copenhagen as the first test case for your bike? Problem. They gave us money. That's actually a joke. Uh, it's, it's, a, case, uh, <laughs> it's actually a joke, but it had to be said. Uh, it's because they are the place where people already cycle pretty much the most, mm -hmm. them and Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about that, that city is that 33% of, of, of cycling, of, the, of trips are done by bicycle, 53%, 55% in the city center are done by bicycle, and they've invested in cycling infrastructure since the early 70s actively, and saw a big increase. And at some point, it saturated, and they kept on putting money, and there was very little increase. So they all of a sudden hit like a glass ceiling in terms of the growth Mode split, one third, one third, one third in the metro area. And to me, that, that's, it looked interesting. It meant that there's something more fundamental going on than just building more bike lanes. And so it meant that what we later verified in research and in questionnaires, that there was a problem in mismatch of the scale of the bo human body, right? Mm -hmm operating a bicycle, and the scale of the city, where people lived, where they worked. So there was some distance beyond which people would just not do it anymore, no matter how many bike lanes right. you build. So that was interesting to do, to, to do it there, because you could copy everything else they did. It's simple. Right. So before we run out of time, let me get one last question for all three of you um, to get like kind of a nutshell thing at the end. We maybe we start on this side this time, um, because as a journalist, I always ask for where are the challenges, where are the problems, what can go wrong, but um, where do you see the chances of the smart city of the future improving on our life in the cities from uh, today? Like, just like, no matter how far into the future, I mean, pick your own time frame, but where do you see the biggest chances for us in the smart city? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we are already experiencing the changes, yeah? So when we, talk, when we think about uh, offerings like, like Uber is bringing to the table or Airbnb or so, these are changes yeah, we are already experiencing. And um, we need to be aware that we will, over the next couple of years, we will see more and more of these kind of offerings, which will basically change our life, yeah? And, uh, and sooner or later, we will see it also happening driven by the cities, which, which they, they, they start to think about it. There, there are cities out there like Munich or like, like Dusseldorf or Amsterdam or Copenhagen. They start thinking about w how smartness looks like in 10 years from now and what are the offerings to bring to the, to the, to the people living in the city. So I think we, we need to think about that and we will probably experience it within the next five to 10 years. So I would say Napoleon once said, geography is a destiny. Mm -hmm. I think that's no longer gonna be true. Connectivity is a destiny and the cities who figure out best how to provide the cleanest air the best mobility, flexible mobility, um, healthcare, education, safety, yeah, and maybe also some political systems, I would add, will actually attract the best talents of the world. And I think Europe is not bad positioned because what needs to come together is capabilities. And as we discussed before, we have capabilities to connect physical and digital world, money, Okay, some money is available. Pain points. I mean, when you stand in a traffic jam, you probably have the pain point. And I would add one thing where we need to work a little bit. Entrepreneurial spirit, courage, and boldness. That is something where I think there are some areas of the world where we still find more of that, but we are 
moving. Yeah? We have done a big step forward in some of the cities. But if that comes together, I would say we can actually shape the city of the future and be very attractive here as a European city. You started, you're going to close. I have, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I understood the question. Well, where do you see the biggest, <laughs> because you know, I was prodding for problems and challenges and what could go wrong. So I basically, as the last question is like, how do you think the smart city is going to improve our life in the near or for the future? How, um, how is it going to change our life? I think, hey, I don't know if it's only going to improve. We're going to see, we're going to see tremendous uh, improvement in ability to move. That's the first thing. That's such a big pain point uh, that, that that's being transformed already in a major way, right? And it's it's just the beginning. So mobility in general is going to change, and and probably things that are closer to the human body. Something there's a missing gap between the person and the car in terms of scale. It's going to get going to get filled by something and many things maybe in combination with public transport, etc. So that's one thing. Uh, maybe more interestingly. Uh, healthcare and education, major disruption. Um, logistics, major disruption. Uh, so all of these will provide improvements because they will ease the load on the, on the infrastructure and allow us to free ourselves to do what we're interested in doing, which is you know, exchange ideas, mate, you know, uh, do whatever else. Um, and also, um, the, and we, we know the risks, right? There's going to be new disasters due to hacking infrastructure. There's going to be uh, um, uh, po pol political systems are going to become in some ways more transparent, but in other ways more fragile. So uh, interesting times ahead. Well, we're already in overtime. So Nico Moore, Claudia Themat, Asaf Biedermann, thank you very much. This has been really interesting. And uh, on to the next panel. Great. Thanks. Thank you.